So that's um, you know almost two decades we've been thinking about uh, and planning towards the kind of event that hit Japan uh, for 20 years here now. Okay, um, around Seattle, the preparation, preparations are mainly visible in the freeways and the um, bridges. Um, I don't know how many of you have noticed the metal jackets going up on all the, I think Seattle's pretty much done now, metal jackets on all the uprights supporting the freeways, okay. As well as you look at the, the new uh, on-ramps and off-ramps going into the stadiums, as well as uh, this, the, all the new work that's been done along uh, Spokane Street, the Spokane Street viaduct leading to West Seattle. All this stuff is just really beefy now compared to the stuff that was built 10, 20, 30 years ago. And, and so you could see the, this by comparing the, 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 the size of, of the um, towers that support um, the freeway, freeway on-ramps and off-ramps of various ages. Um, what, the Seattle Freeway was built in 1960, something like that, I find. You know, I, I remember it going in. Um, and, um, and, and a lot of those uprights are still visible, and they're, and they're, really, they're okay, but they're kind of slender compared to what, what's going in now. No. Um, if we, can we, next, next slide, yes. Okay. If we go out to the coast, uh, let's see. Okay, um, the, the wave, modeled wave that we saw, saw um, earlier um, has been run on, run up onto the shore, and so for example, here's Grays Harbor on the outer Washington coast, and the blue areas are areas where um, wave inundation is expected, whereas the brown areas are areas that are expected to um, stand above the waves. Um, and then you could take those computerized um, wave models and um, pr project them onto points on land and see what the waves um, will look like over time. Um, next slide. Okay, and then in turn, if you, once you have those models, then in turn you could uh, design escape routes um, based on where you expect the waves to, to go and how high. And so, um, so these are, this is one town on, in coastal Oregon um, where the brown is the areas that are expected to still be safe after a magnitude nine earthquake. Um, and then um, in between waves or, or before the first wave hits, um, the routes that people should take to get to, to higher, safer and higher ground, um, whatever they can. Okay, and next slide. Okay, and so all these are integrated into, into signs, right? So if you're on this road, go this way, right? Um, and then uh, they, they, they route you down the arterials and then up, up onto the hills. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, um, so how did we get here? Um, We got here by learning from the Japanese, um, basically, and, and not present-day Japanese, but basically, but the Japanese of ancient time. Um, the, we adopted a more open, open-minded approach. Um, our perspective as Americans was, was that we seem to be headed toward our own large earthquake, but we have no historical record of this stuff whatsoever, and and because we know nothing. We are willing to take knowledge from wherever it is, um, and or whatever field it is, because we need all the help we can get. Um, and so it was just a different mindset that we started with. And one of the one of the um, key pieces of all of this is the re written records of the of the samurai uh, who ran Japan uh, 300 years ago. And so um, today I'll be sharing. Um, well, so. Along the Japanese coast, there are six known documents that still survive describing a, a huge tsunami that hit Japan about 300 years ago. Okay, and they extend from uh, northern Japan, um, the kind of the landscape that we hear about today. Um, um, uh, for example, Sendai is, Sendai is right there where, where the uh, Honshu coast makes a right turn, uh, a 90 degree angle turn there. Um, and, um, Maybe about halfway down there is uh, the Fukushima area. Okay, so that's that's the coast that we're always reading about in the paper today. Um, and uh, the written records of the samurai about about, about this tsunami event um, extend down to uh, Wakayama Ken, um, the the big uh, peninsula um, at the bottom of the slide there. Yes. So um, 
a huge tsunami that finally stopped it. Okay, so these are what the original documents look like. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Moriguchi thinks that my, my Japanese reading is really good. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm in the Japanese um, elementary school second grade level. <laughs> um, and I've been told that if I was a student in, in Tokyo, where the students are much sharper, they said, well, David, you, you read about as well as a, a kindergarten, kindergarten student. <laughs> okay, but in any case, um, when we look at these documents, um, Elaine, you know, you and I, we can pick out a few characters. For example, this is like, uh, right there, uh, uh, 10, 1, month, 8, 9, right? Uh, so, Juichi uh, Katsu, Hachi, something, something. Uh, and then it's Kokono to the ninth day, Made, and, and you could, we could pick out, pick out words here and there without any help. Okay. Um, but it helps a lot when you could um, enlist the help of, of specialists, um, scholars. And, and so these are documents that are much like reading um, raw Shakespearean English today, um, you know, from the original documents. It's, it's tough to, to read. But there are specialists uh, who read those things every day. Um, and, and similarly, there are specialists in Japan who read uh, Japanese historical documents every day. And so they could just read this stuff, you know, just literally, literally split to us. Um, and so, let's see, next slide. And so, uh, you know, we uh, Americans and, and translators um, are just madly scribbling down what, they're, what they are telling us. Yes? Okay, yes, okay. Okay, later, yes, okay, okay, yes. Okay, um, and so we can take that first um, same uh, document that I, we just looked at and, and spread the, the lines out a little bit and then write in the uh, Romaji or the um, reading in, in Western characters um, as well as uh, English translations. Okay, so. Um, it's kind of hard to read um, because uh, Japanese sentences are kind of backwards in English. Um, but they read something like this. Genroku, uh, 12th year, 11th month, 8th to 9th day, high tide on the coast, swept away houses here and there. Atsugaru Ishi, there was salt water up to Kubota crossing. At Nori Nowaki, it reached up to Inari no Shita. And so villagers panicked. At the time, the fire broke out at the small port of Kumagasaki because of the high waves. However, an earthquake did not occur. Number of houses, about 21. Okay, so this is just um, one example of the six documents that, that we looked at. Um, and I picked it in part to show you First of all, because it's short, and so just to give you, give you an idea of, of the detail that is in these documents. Um, and the second thing is that it specifically mentions that there was no earthquake. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so that was... Uh, okay. okay, that was Tsugaru Ishi, which is the, town, the second town up in the far north there. Okay, and from there we're going to swing to the to sort of cent south center of Japan, Miho, um, just south of Mount Fuji. Okay, next slide. Okay, okay so uh, there's Mount Fuji. Um, does anyone know the road that's leading across the middle of the picture there? Uh, and these these are period diagrams. These are uh, this is the, the Genroku period of Japan, the sort of time of the flowering of Japanese uh, the, the Japanese arts. Is. Okay. Does anybody know this road? Tokaido. Okay, okay, the Tokaido, right. Okay, so the Tokaido is the famous road that leads from, from Edo, or the uh, predecessor of Tokyo, um, to Kyoto, right? And all the, many of the uh, samurai movies that we all watch today are set among travelers traveling this road. Um, and so, we'll next look at the document that comes from Miho, which is, um, the village on the sand spit um, there. Uh, Miho has historical significance to Japanese Americans. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe there's three connections. Um, the first is that most of us 
or sort of our first awakening of the existence of Japan was um, when, when uh, Shogun hit the TV screens here. Uh, it was a big deal. <laughs> and so, so there's, a, there's a scene where, where um, Toru Naga-san, the uh, Shogun of Japan, is flying his hawks in a country setting. Okay. And that real actual setting is, is here at the village of Miho. Okay. Um, the second reason um, Miho is important historically and culturally is that there's a, um, a no play where an angel comes down from the heavens and you know she's <laughs> here and decides that she wants to take out her robe and, and wash herself. And, and so she, you know, she hangs her robe and, um, and she's washing herself in the bay. And then a fisherman comes by and finds the robe. Okay. And says, oh, I'm going to take this robe home. Okay. So this is the, the famous no play of Hakoromo, right? the, the robe of feathers. And so the, the angel and the fisherman have to negotiate this deal um, and, and where, where she will dance the heavenly dance for, her, for him in exchange to get her robe back. And she needs this robe because without it, she can't fly back to the heavens. Um, and, and so, um, so this is, students of Japanese culture will, will, will recognize the setting from that. Um, as well as there's one more connection here between Minho Village and, and Japanese Americans. And that is um, when I was there and we we're talking to the in local innkeeper there, um, she says to me, uh, Yamaguchi-san, do you know any endos in the United States? And I said, sure I do. You know, endo is a very common Japanese American name. And she says, well, those families probably came from our village. Okay, because at the, in the um, like late, late Meiji or early Meiji time, um, when, when Japan was, had just made contact with the West and settlers had come, Japanese settlers had, had first gone to Hawaii, and then they began to come to uh, the mainland of the United States, a lot of um, young guys had left the village of Miho to uh, try their luck in the United States. And many of them were named Endo. So um, that's the story of the, Endo, of the Endos. But in any case, let's, let's see what these villagers had to say. Okay. And this guy, um, his writing is a lot different than the writings of, uh, than all the other writings, um, in that he is, is not a samurai. Okay, uh, the samurai were the most educated class. Okay, um, he is a pe basically a, a peasant or a, a uh, village headman. Okay? And so his writing is kind of like mine, where he's writing along, and you'll notice places where he can't remember the kanji or the. the, the Chinese characters for something. So then he'll write it partially in Chinese and partially in Japanese, in Japanese phonetic characters. Other places as you're going along, for example here, he's mixing up the uh, hiragana and the katakana because he's, he, you know, he obviously doesn't write very much, right? So, um, and I do this because I don't write very much either. And so I like this guy right away because I thought, oh, this guy, here's a guy like me, <laughs> struggling with his letters, but, 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 he, but he's also kind of a thinking guy. Um, and I like what he has to say is the most observant. And it makes sense because these are guys out on the beach at the time when the tsunami is coming, coming in. Okay, versus the, the, the um, sort of the ruling samurai who are hovering in their castles, right, in, in shelter and getting reports from runners, okay? They're not really seeing what this guy is seeing. Okay, okay so what does um, our village headman here have to say? Um, so it starts uh, on the same day, actually. Juni ga tsuko kono ga akemutsu mae yori nami. Okay, so 12th month, ninth day, from the, before the morning hour of six, the water became high from off wada, wada to ie no mae. A high tide, or something like it, entered Ego and reached as far as within the pine groves.